Uh, where do I start? Oh yes, I've got two colleagues who are going to make me uh, look better than I actually am, which is kind of good. Uh, I, I was thinking about what Chris Steele says. First of all, I have to tell you that uh, I do try and occasionally phone God from time to time. Richard Dawkins tells me I'm delusional, and I'll show you a bit more about how delusional I am in a minute, because actually, Chris, I could be the sexy face of the stroke, <laughs> fundamentally. Um, oh yes. <laughs> um, I like, I like the sound of this science stroke art. Um, it's the funny bedfellow science and art. The idea of Norman Winston in bed with Joan Sutherland, for example, the, the opera singer, I can't quite get my head around. Brian Cox and Tracy Emin, I'm starting to see something there, but it's, it's, I've got some weird thoughts in that. Anyway, I, ended up, I, wrote, a, I wrote a book it, 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 when I was having my recovery, the, the first month of the stroke, and lots of what the previous guys have said resonates, you know, the, the idea that there was a point previous to uh, the last 20 years when no one um, gave any hope for any, any success. I have to say I'm a contrary sod, and if somebody told me there was no hope of survival, I would be planning to take over the world right now, um, because I don't trust anybody who tells me I can't do anything. I don't know if you, you definitely agree with that, don't you, Tony? Yeah, absolutely. Don't believe anybody when they tell you you can't do anything. There's a thing going on, what's the thing in nursing about um, unrealistic opt optimism or something like that. I'm full of un unrealistic optimism. Uh, but at the first days of having a stroke, uh, a number of things do, do go weird on you. Um, the, the, the attitude of nursing staff is quite interesting. Um, and I've written a little, one of the little stories in here is about it. Uh, I'm going to try and recite it rather than read it because uh, I can't find my glasses most of the time. Um, <clears throat> it goes like this. Do you not think that the skin of plucked chickens looked very much like testicles. Well, that must have got the two nurses thinking about their own chickens while they were giving me a bed bath. Because one said, I've got three, they're lovely. I love them to bits. The other one said, I've got four, they're smashing. I was thinking I've got two and I'm quite attached to them, but I didn't go anywhere with that. Um, and then he said, what I like to do is I like to get their, their, their eggs and their shells and mix it together with the feed and feed it back to the, the chickens. They love it, says Gail. Um, and Jane says, that's a bit uncaring. It's, it's cannibalism, isn't it? Uh, and Gail says, no, it's OK. They've not been had by the rooster. Uh, oh, I see, says Jane. It seems a bit inhuman. Yes, I thought to myself. A bit like talking about um, chickens while you're washing somebody's testicles. But anyway, let's move on. Um, <laughs> after about a couple of weeks, um, a lady came, comes around with a clipboard. Now, I've had a cognitive assessment test. I've seen it done twice before in, in Salford and also in Macclesfield, where I, was, where I was transferred to. So I'd seen what they were doing, and I could see her coming towards me with her clipboard. And um, when she gets to me, she says, um, we'd like to look at clocks. So I show her what 10 to 2 looks like, and also what 20 past 4 looks like. And then um, we, we uh, have a look at the similarities between a banana and an orange, and also between a bicycle and an aeroplane. I get those right, although it's quite difficult, I think. Um, <clears throat> then she says, um, <clears throat> right, what I want to do is I'm going to recite five words back to you, and I want you to tell them straight away to me, and also remember them to the end of the test. Okay, um, there wouldn't by any chance be church, red, velvet, face, and daisy, would they? Uh, yes, they would. It was just a guess, I said. Um, <clears throat> she said, all right, so I'll tell you what, why don't you think of five new ones? She said, I can't think of that. It remains to be seen that actually, maybe I shouldn't have been the one that was cognitively assessed. <laughs> um, anyway, there we are. Um, <laughs> one of the things um, in this book, which is available, I'm available for bar mitzvahs and, and funerals and weddings and everything, but this book is available uh, in the foyer, <laughs> as they say. I've always wanted to say that. I don't know what it means, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, I wanted to read you one that I wrote um, because it ties in with a lot of what Tony was saying, I think, and... and, and I think it's true. When we were children, when I was a child in the 60s, um, I was enchanted by the idea of resistance fighters battling oppression. I thought if the Nazis had invaded and subjugated England when I was a teenager, I would have wanted to bomb in military installations and undertaken all kinds of guerrilla warfare under the cloak of darkness, or even in full daylight if I could have got away with it. I'm sure that most people believe there is something noble about fighting oppression. Uh, in any circumstance, and probably they like to feel that they would be a hero, and either by helping to win the war or at least contributing to an ongoing battle. 
And yet here we are, we have one million plus people affected by stroke every year, oppressed into victimhood, staggering about, clenching our affected side, dragging our body through life, assuming people are going to help us. And I realized that my stroke was my chance to fight back, to bomb the ideology that a stroke survivor is a victim, to incite myself and others into resistance, fighting to overcome and throw off the oppressor. I might not win the Victoria Cross or the Resistance Medal or whatever bit of brass they give freedom fighters these days, but this is my chance to fight tyranny of the stroke. Um, so that's in the book. And um, I will do you another one of that if you're not too bored with me. Um, uh, let's have a look at this one. Uh, yeah. What happens between... What happens in Las Vegas has to stay in Las Vegas. What happens between the sheets of a hospital, well, that has to stay in the hospital too, because sheets happen. Um, <laughs> Mr. Kyriakos cries out every night for Kathleen, although his wife is called Raina. Um, Mrs. Baltimore Rugeley looks through my cupboards looking for her son, her Volvo, and her stabled horses. Delirium has become the new normal for me, Dana, she's seen it all and she's cleaned off most of it off the mattress. Thailand is next to Burma, we decide, as we discuss where the patient was born. The bell rings, victims come and go, and Ross wants to die every night at 2.30, as regular as a broken clock. Yeah, that's right. I've seen it all through the bed bars of this bedlam. Anyway, that's uh, the book. Um, I'm now going to uh, boy, uh, entertain you with, <laughs> with singing uh, and uh, other such things, ably assisted by my... Wonderful friend Tim, who I've known for 40 years, and for the incredibly attractive and extraordinarily, uh, what, what's, what's, what did we call him, mother? <laughs> his mother that's his mother there. Um, <laughs> not my mother. <laughs> I'm going to tell you about my mother in a minute. She was a contrary so and so. No, he is the star of the show, um, is, is our Lawrence. Um, I'm going to play you, first of all, two, well, I'm going to do two songs, and then you'll get rid of me. Um, the first one, uh, my... It's, I've had three, a, a bizarre three years, around about this time of year. Um, in May 2012, I met a very lovely woman who sat over there. Um, and then my mum died the year after, I mean, a few weeks after. My mum was a funny old sod. She did say to me uh, about a previous girlfriend, um, do you know, that, that girl, she's all right, but she, she smells like a cross between a chemist and a brothel. Now, I, th I thought that was very strange because I didn't know she'd ever been in a chemist. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, um, uh, she was a contrary sod. And when she was um, in the last few days, I, I sang her this song. She was a bit of a Louis Armstrong fan, but we've tried the voice and it, it gets everybody slightly worried when I do the, uh, the Louis Armstrong voice. So I'll, I'll oscillate between the two. And if everybody looks frightened, I'll stop doing Louis. I'll come back as me. <clears throat> One, two, three, four. <laughs> By the river's foaming water See the side of bottles walls Well, we don't do what we ought to Everybody's got their faults You lost your innocence and your patience Your car keys and your shoes you weren't looking for adventure when I came bounding into you. Don't be afraid, or oh, I'm not gonna hurt you. I wanna stay here with you and get you through the dark. Angels all around you Don't let the world confound you Your dreams They'll set you free
there's the pocket. If one is empty, it cuts and it bites. Money spoke, but all it ever said was, if they're suckers, it serves them right. I know you're frightened and you're lonely, and you don't know which way to go. Hold my hand now and we'll find out everything we need to know. Don't be afraid. Oh, I'm not gonna hurt you. I wanna stay here with you and help you through the dark. Don't be afraid. See, there's angels all around you. Don't let the world confound you. Your dreams will set you free. Chris um, Larkin, oh, sorry, I'm just going to get some water, I hope you don't mind. Chris Larkin said to me, it's always good to have a bit of emotion. Uh, and um, I think the last time I did that, I nearly blubbed uh, uh, enormously um, thinking about uh, my mum on that day. But I'm now going to get myself in a real state by telling you that the next song, the mid late I wrote, uh, the, the most of the song I wrote before my stroke, but the mid late is informed, I think is the correct phrase, by a thing I said to Sarath, who sat there filming me for posterity, or for my posterior, I'm not quite sure which. Um, <clears throat> uh, I said to her as we were laying in the hospital, it suddenly dawned on, on us in the accident emergency ward in Royal Hope Hospital in Salford that this was quite serious. Um, and it was really a, a statement I said about my daughter Phoebe. I said to her, you know, you will look after Phoebe, won't you? And when her bottom lip started going, um, he realised that it's a bit scary. And everything the three previous speakers have said about the nature of what, what one could have if you have another three strokes in your right was this thing that they misunderstood what you'd said. Uh, I had no, no, no knowledge of that at all. Um, but uh, one thing I do know is that I care about an awful lot of people. And it turns out one or two of them have some moderate feeling towards me as well, which is quite nice. And this one's called... Uh, um, the world looks all right tonight, and look out for me blubbing in the middle eight. If you know what a middle eight is. One, two, three, four. They've been skiving and the streets are soaking wet. There was this orange girl and a paper boy, and they don't know what they're gonna get. And something makes me think that it's something that they'll want. You see, the world looks all right tonight. All the stars, they have been dazzling In the sky and on the ground They seem to be saying something You know what? They do not make a sound And if it is bad news Oh well, it will not bring me down Because my world looks alright Take good care of my little one 
close the light off when she goes to sleep And please say a prayer for my little one The world's a scary place when you're free Well, my engine is shagged, my exhaust is shot And my tires, they're in a mess I never made much money Oh, what the hell did I expect? But I'm lying in the dark Oh, and her arms, they hold me tight You see, the world looks all right tonight You see, the world looks all right tonight